Cellular agriculture and alternative protein are fast becoming technological options to consider as our agricultural systems start to struggle with population growth, poverty and climate change. German-based TCB, or the cultivated bee, are pioneers in this kind of biotech and are keen to see it added to the global agenda. I sat down with CEO Dr. Hamid Nouri here in Dubai to talk about the feasibility of cultivated meat and precision fermentation. I have to say, particularly for someone in your kind of area of expertise and innovation, a gathering like this has to be worth it just for the fact that there are so many different people here with so many different skills. It indeed is. Like you have people from all over the planet with various ideas, craziest ideas, but also ideas that have been proven. And this is necessary because true innovation happens when you put the right people in the right place at the right time and make sure that they are able to communicate and talk to each other. We are benefiting from it. We are very happy to be here. And I think that events like this one are also going to be a huge facilitator for our discipline. That's great. Let's take this to the studio and talk in a bit more detail. Of course. Thank you. Hamid, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Okay, first of all, briefly talk us through what the cultivated bee or TCB, what that is, what you do. So the cultivated bee is a bioengineering company. We established it in 2021. Um, our headquarters are in Heidelberg, Germany. We have subsidiaries in, in Ontario, in Canada. In a nutshell, we are a company that is focused on protein production machines. However, we have a very specific way of defining what a machine is for us. Everything in the world can be a machine. So we work on producing so-called bioreactors. These are, in fact, heavy machines made of steel or glass that provide an environment for different organisms to grow in, bacteria, even animal cell cultures. You are always exposed to them without consciously knowing it. Uh, the most expensive drugs and important uh, drugs in the world are actually produced in such bioreactors, but also, for instance, COVID vaccines were produced in such systems. Now we are bringing them, specifying them for the future of agriculture in the world. So we produce proteins that could also be useful for human or animal nutrition. That's one set of machines that we focus on. And the other thing is that everything else for us is a machine as well. Like plants are for us machines too. Typically plants produce their own sort of proteins, but what we are focused on is that we bring proteins that normally do not occur in plants, animal proteins for instance, that can either enrich vegan products for the market or also provide alternatives for a more scalable production of rare proteins with certain nutritional values. So this is all about, a principal focus is resource scarcity, presumably, with a view to the agriculture sector. Resource scarcity is a major factor for our philosophy, right? So because um, we generally believe that humanity has been dealing with resources as if they are infinite, whereas they are obviously not. And we are reaching slowly that limit. So it would provide us with, an, with a good opportunity to generate more for the ever-growing human population. Humanity is growing. It would require protein for its nutrition. It is meant to be doubled in the next decade. In order to satisfy that need, we need to look for, for other resources as well. But we take a very technological approach at this. So we are less ideological in that sense, or less focused on the end product, be it the actual food, but more on the technology that comes with it. So I've read that you concentrate on things like cultivated meat and precision fermentation, so I guess these are cell structures of some sort, but does this mostly apply to replacing meat and replacing crops? No, 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 not at all. As a matter of fact, precision fermentation is added value for typical and traditional agriculture. Um, imagine normally when, when you have a bundle of soybean or a bundle of barley, you may get 30 cents for that. Once we bring your proteins inside that, the, the farmer is going to get potentially hundreds of dollars just for cultivating them while doing exactly the same as she was doing before. So it is by no means an eradication or replacement of existing traditional agriculture. 
and we oppose even that idea. We can rather consider it as a very enriching, complementing element that would, on the one side, add to the nutritional profiles of the humanity, but also fill the gap for the growing population. So, nonetheless, bringing some new technologies that everyone would benefit, but I wouldn't say that we are going to challenge the existing landscape. Okay, so Hamid, we're getting into areas that few people understand in any amount of detail. So is there any way you can just simplify the process of part of what you do so that I can understand it? Sure. L let me maybe start with an example uh, to break it down. Um, there's currently a large group of people who are interested in trying out or exclusively even consuming vegan products. And there are vegan sausages and different type of products on the market. The, the main issue with most of them is the texture, right? They do not normally have the texture that you're used to, feel rubbery, etc. That texture is provided by animal proteins that are normally not uh, occurring in, in plants. So what uh, we do is that we bring those proteins um, using a, a, a relatively solid technology inside the plant. And what happens is that Basically, the genetic machinery of the plant that is normally reading one by one and translating along the genetic code proteins now learns that there is, in fact, a new protein to, to translate and put there, and it just does that. The advantage is the plant is authentic, is exactly the same plant that you had before. It just now learned to do something new. In a sense, we, we, we teach plants or soybeans how to move if you want to have it like that. The, there is an advantage, a major advantage here, uh, in terms of sustainability as well, and this is that that plant and everything else that was in it can still be used for anything else as well. A lot of these plants can produce isolates, protein isolates, be used for biomass, for animal feed, etc. None of it will be affected by the fact that the plant has no superpowers. And in terms of particularly in crops, is this similar to genetic modification as far as wide-scale crop growing is concerned? In a sense, yes, although the, the target and the ideas are, are different. So we need to uh, use genetic modification in order to teach the plant to translate its amino acids into proteins that were, for instance, animal-like proteins. But the typical genetic engineering approaches in, in plant biology, in agriculture, were meant to just increase the harvest. Now we are on top of that adding additional value to the level that plants could become new sources of producing pharmaceuticals or also food ingredients that normally would come from, for instance, animal breeding, etc. So are you being encouraged by the agricultural sector or by the food production sector or are you being challenged by them? Are people welcoming or suspicious or both of, of the work that you're doing? I would say both, to be very honest. Uh, we have a lot of interest from the food production sector. Some companies uh, or mother company in Family Foods, for instance, in Germany, is a company that has focused a lot on transforming the industry from within. This is where we even were inspired to start doing so, doing what we are doing right now. There is, in that sense, a need for transformation that larger industries are recognizing. And I have to admit, the larger the factories and the industries are, the higher is the chance that they like these new ideas, because these new ideas help them adjust to the new trends in the society and the new mindset of the society. There is some resistance, on the other hand, which I believe to a certain degree is also due to the fact that we haven't been able yet to communicate perfectly the advantages for all the sides, right? So for instance, many people from the traditional agriculture may consider what we do competing, whereas I consider that being synergizing and in the end, in fact, adding value. For instance, even for the animal breeding industry, these ideas could be synergizing because they could lead to circular economy effects where you may even get more value out of what you had before, while you may even breed less animals. So it could be a true win-win, but communication hasn't been taking too much place here to, to, to reach that.
Well, you mentioned synergy and communication. Here we are at COP28. This is the largest such gathering to look at all these kind of issues. And we know that the headline is emissions reduction. But beneath that, there is the sustainability conversation. All sorts of different parties come in to talk exactly about how we manage our resources, how we proceed, how we make best use of what we have left. Surely you have quite a part to play in those discussions. I, I think we do. I, as a matter of fact, I think that we do. And uh, this comes on both sides, climate change and sustainability element. Um, resource scarcity was one of the topics that you mentioned that goes hand in hand with the sustainability topics. Less energy consumption, less resource consumption and gaining more value is one. But we also need to pay attention to the fact that the climate change is going to affect traditional agriculture as well. And we need to find new ways for the farmers of the future to actually generate revenue, to, to gain um, some power over time, although the world is changing. In the region where we are currently, the first conflicts are occurring because of lack of water, right? This is something we cannot underestimate and just ignore it. There is no way that we can have very large scale traditional agriculture here and there where there is no water. So we need to come up with new approaches that would enable that. And this is one of those things that or companies focused on non-ideologically and very technologically oriented, very pragmatic approach in that sense. But in, in its essence, we are there so that in 20 years, farmers in this region can also feed themselves. So for you then, Dr. Hamid Nouri, how important is this work on a personal level? Look, I have been a scientist my entire life, right? I, I never wanted to be anything different. And it turned out that this, what we are doing right now could be a legacy element for, for my entire life. Um, doing something that has an impact, has a direct measurable impact for the human society is something everyone would dream of. At least I was always dreaming of being and doing. And I think it's in, in, in a sense part of what I always wanted to do and what I always wanted to be. I mean, absolute pleasure. Great talking to you. Thanks. Thank you so much.